Hello and welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe, a place in our galaxy where ideas collide and where faith and reason intersect. I'm Doug Keck, your host, coming to you from the mothership here at our EW10 studios in the heart of Irondale, Alabama on Mother Angelica Way. And today's topic, we are continuing on with authentic, spontaneous prayer. This is part two. Uh, we didn't get through everything last week, so just remember you can email us questions at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Also, post your questions. Very popular to do this on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EWTN online, hashtag FSUniverse. That's a lot, but the people who know how to do it, they understand what that means. Send us a tweet as well at twitter.com forward slash EWTN, hashtag FSUniverse as well. And for all things Father Spitzer, there is one place to go. It is the Magis Center website, magiscenteroneword.com. And of course, you can always check out our information on EW10.com and our religious catalog has many of his resources. Don't forget that Father will be speaking at the upcoming Los Angeles uh, Congress coming up, uh, Catechetical Congress, and he'll be there. And uh, Brian Patrick will be there uh, taping some interviews for us with our radio team, Tom Price out there as well. So if you're out on the West Coast, you might want to check that out. But at this point, we can check out Father Spitzer on our own West Coast studios in Orange County, California, where he is right now. Hello, Father. Great to have you back on hey, the show good. this week. I hear you, but now you're coming into now you're coming into focus. There you are. So how's it going? Good week and everything. Uh, oh yeah, great week and uh, great to be back with you and uh, get my dose of humor here. There we go. So uh, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm killing you slowly here in small doses. Uh, let me ask you: for, You're going to be speaking out at, at the sure. at the conference out there at the catechetical right. conference. What are the topics you're going to be speaking about? Just wondering. Well, that that new book um, on suffering that's coming out, um, I will be giving a talk on that. Just contending with suffering, mm -hmm. of you know, kind of five points and how to transform suffering into something that's quite negative into something quite positive uh, for us, for our salvation, for you know, uh, the, the deepening of our spiritual mm -hmm. life. And that's the first talk, and that will be on Friday. The second talk will be a pro-life talk, uh, and it will be trying to you know, sort of put together uh, a whole pro-life philosophy mm -hmm. um, and uh, comparing um, you know, euthanasia and slavery and a variety of other uh, you know, uh, uh, topics uh, in the pro-life area. Uh, pro-life philosophy. So that'll be on Saturday and then in between times uh, on Friday and Saturday I will be doing those interviews with EWTN and mm -hmm. generally there's a table and uh, you can visit us at the EWTN table uh, in the conference center right. uh, as well and uh, Majus will also have a, a table. table down there too. And are you doing a book uh, signing while you're center. out there? Are you doing a book signing and everything while yeah. you're out there? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I sh okay. sure do. Okay, yeah. so people should look for that as well. It's great if you can stop by and say hello to Brian Patrick. I'm sure all of us would like to see you sure. out there. So that's the L.A. Congress. Let's uh, talk about today's program. We were talking about spontaneous prayer. And again, uh, when you first hear about this, you kind of think of like charismatic prayer, but you're really talking <laughs> about those those little prayers. Why don't you just mention what that was, and then we'll get into our first question. Sure. Uh, these are sort of short, crisp, memorable prayers that are very, very easy to remember that we can use when, in times when we need help, in times when we have to forgive others, uh, you know, or pray for our enemies, in times when, you know, we need forgiveness um, or we want to ask forgiveness, um, you know, from others um, or from God. And times, of course, uh, in general, uh, just when we want to sort of get ourselves under control, uh, you know, because uh, something's flying out of control, whether it be fear, whether it be anger, whether it be life circumstances, um, you know, how do we, you know, get God involved right away? And so there's a variety of prayers, uh, uh, you know, that mm -hmm. we can use. They're very short, uh, they're very repeatable, they're very memorable. And so uh, as I, I was making an offer last time, uh, uh, if you send us an email request, uh, we will definitely send you an 11 page, uh, uh, you know, little article there with the prayers and mm -hmm. an explanation on, on how to use them free of charge. 
uh, but we will not, uh, we don't do the surface mail uh, things anymore. It just uh, overwhelms our staff. There's just too many requests. But if you send it by email or you have a, a, a you know, relative who's got an email, we'll send it to them and they can print it off for you. And we're glad to give it to you free of charge. Okay, sounds great. Pick, check that out as well going to the, the Magis Center and find out how they can get that. So let's talk about some questions. Now, it's interesting because we actually had a couple of questions our producer, Alan Lackey, dug up from programs that we've done over the last few weeks, and we wanted to get to these. Okay. Sometimes, as you know, people write to us and say, how come you didn't use my question? So here's one that, that came from <laughs> last month's Pro-Life, and you're going to be speaking about Pro-Life at the okay. conference coming up next week. Right. A question sure. from last month's Pro-Life episode. Could our president write an emancipation proclamation for the unborn. What stands in the way? And this is from Ed. Now, I don't know, I know you hang out with constitutional scholars and Supreme Court justices, yeah. but you're, mm -hmm. and you don't even play one on TV, so what do you think? <laughs> well, here's the, the quick uh, uh, you know, answer to that question. First of all, he could write an emancipation proclamation for the unborn, and who knows, he might. Uh, the, the difficulty, though, um, with that um, is that it would just be like a presidential decree. Um, and, and of course, it, it also has to go into law. Now, some presidential decrees can be acted upon by an executive order, but this kind of a general decree, uh, you would ha actually have to have uh, quite a few specifics. You'd have to formulate it into an executive order in order for him to do that by himself. But if he did, want uh, to have an Emancipation Proclamation for the Unborn, if he did put a great deal of detail into it, if he did put it into a fashion or it could be um, uh, passed by a majority of the House and a majority of the Senate and, and uh, go into law, and if it were in such a way that the Supreme Court would allow it to pass muster, then for all intents and purposes, yes, he mm -hmm. could do that and it would become law and it would uh, become uh, effective. Um, I think the, the strategy, though, uh, that he is uh, going to take, see, a constitutional amendment, that's much harder mm -hmm. uh, than your own suggestion of an Emancipation Proclamation, because that requires two-thirds vote uh, in the House and the Senate, and that's a very, very difficult bar to get over, uh, given the, right now, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the makeup of the, of the House and the Senate. However, um, there is another way, and of course that would be uh, the hoped for way, uh, that if we get a Supreme Court justice or maybe two Supreme Court justices right. uh, that are open to seeing uh, that preborn human beings are really human lives, not only deserving, but requiring mm -hmm. protection under the law, requiring protection under the uh, provision of the inalienable rights guaranteed by our Declaration of Independence. If, if that is present, uh, if these two uh, justices are present, then I think uh, mm -hmm. we're going to go, we'll be able to go ahead and, and maybe overturn Roe versus Wade, in which case there'd be a variety of other kinds of legal remedy mm -hmm. remedies uh, including one uh, where you actually have um, you know um, a house and senate bill that can you know go through the ordinary processes uh, to protect human life it can't then be vetoed by the supreme court as being unconstitutional mm -hmm. and therefore you'd not only have an overturning of this of the uh, Roe v. Wade, but you have a better legal provision. I mean, I, I don't think it's very good for the Supreme Court to be doing legislating. Right. And now I know Marbury versus Madison, which is a very important Supreme Court decision, sort of opened the door to that. But the overreach uh, by the courts, I mean, and especially you know in, in recent history, mm -hmm. I mean, the courts have been overreaching like mad and have become almost super supreme legislators who are not voted into office, who, uh, you know, don't have, uh, you know, anything uh, but themselves in, in many ways to be responsible to, because they say, well, we have the law to be responsible to. But what is the law? Mm -hmm. Is it the positive law? Well, Roe v. Wade certainly
certainly wasn't the positive law. Mm -hmm. uh, that was sort of invented. Uh, you know, uh, what do you mean by the law? Do you mean uh, what the, the, the sense of, of certain influential people in the mm -hmm. society is at a particular given time? Well, if that's the law, that kind of law ought to be, you know, done through a legislature or, in the case of a, a federal law, through the Congress right. and the Senate. So there's, there's something radically wrong with the overreach of the Supreme Court and also appellate courts uh, where they just really do believe they have the right uh, to legislate far beyond you know, the positive law. I, I'm not a strict constructionist, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a natural law theorist, and I can tell you something yeah. right now. I, I just think, you know, we are so far beyond strict constructionism and positivism. I mean, you know, uh, the, the Supreme Court has gone kind of, you know, haywire with mm. itself and the other courts as well. I think at, at some juncture, it has to be reined in. Right. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, upcoming Supreme Court appointments will get much more level head right. about having some responsibility to interpreting the Constitution, the positive law. Once that occurs, I think then you can get a normal process uh, in place where, uh, you know, bills can be passed to protect human life um, without having that onerous right. kind of bar of a two-thirds of the House and the Senate, you know, trying to get a, a constitutional law. Uh, Amendment passed, or or the, the right. or you know the state right. legislatures, but it's it's a high bar to right. to get over. Okay, very interesting, and of course uh, there is a connection between uh, the original Emancipation Proclamation and what we're talking about, whether people like it or not, even though it gets denied many times. And of course, putting things back to the mm -hmm. states would also at least give people in a federalist system mm -hmm. the ability to at least have some control over what's happening in their locale which mm -hmm. seems to be what the, That's uh, right. obviously, the, our, our founding fathers had in mind. Uh, you know, and as you said, mm -hmm. there's a difference between ju judicial review of whether something is legal by the law and deciding that I don't really like the law because uh, you know, it doesn't fit mm -hmm. into my purview of how I think things should be as opposed to whether I like it or not, yeah. this is the law. And also, I think we have to acknowledge that sometimes uh, Congress has been very happy to delegate a lot of its own responsibility to not only the courts, but to the executive branch, because it allows them to act like, don't blame me when I'm up for election. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, there's a lot of truth to that. Oh, yeah, I do know what you mean. And you, you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, immediately, if, if you had an overturning of Roe v. Wade, uh, the, uh, the authority uh, to determine whether abortion is legal or not would go automatically back to the states, whether there was a federal law passed or not. So you, you would automatically get that advantage. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and it would become, uh, you know, up to the state uh, legislatures to determine, you know, whether or not, you know, abortion is a crime. And, you know, just again with your second point, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court did, in fact, reverse 200 years worth of case precedents mm -hmm. that basically gave uh, the preborn human being rights to inherit rights of protection in the womb, rights of the parents to sue if anything went wrong uh, to the fetus, say because of a car accident right, and, the, right. and the baby died and so forth and so on. So you have all these other precedents that were completely ignored by the Supreme Court. They reach out for a brand new precedent in order to justify the Roe v. Wade decision, which you know was nowhere to be found in, 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 in state laws, federal law, case precedents. I mean, it's the most remarkable right. thing in, in the whole wide world. But uh, you know, yeah, I mean, talk about going beyond strict constructionism, positivism, natural law. I mean, it's just bizarre. So, I mean, I think we, we you know, this was done, you know, by the Supreme Supreme Court unanimously in the Dred mm -hmm. Scott decision, which unanimously approved slavery. And we all know what happened to that decision. And now today, everybody mm -hmm. views it as, you know, one of the, the lowest points of U.S. Right. history. Right. I think the same thing will happen with Roe v. Wade. You know, the, the people who passed it at the time 
were not just short-sighted. You know, they were taking Marbury versus Madison mm -hmm. and not just running with it. They put it in a space capsule right. and shot it off, you know. I mean, it just, it's just unbelievable. So, yeah, I think we, we just have to get more level-headed again. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember that the courts are responsible to inalienable rights of life, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness as much as they are responsible to the positive law. Right. I mean, you know, we can't ignore inalienable rights. They're not in the Constitution uh, for the very reason that they don't need to be in the Constitution. They're self evident mm -hmm. and they were proclaimed to be self-evident in our Declaration of Independence. Everyone should know this. Everyone should know that minimum justice means protecting the life of every human being. And the false distinction made by the Supreme Court differentiating a human being from a person, mm -hmm. right, a person like legal personhood, meaning you deserve protection under the laws. We've never had mm -hmm. that fake distinction before, except in the great uh, Dred Scott decision mm -hmm. where the Supreme Court once again, you know, basically ignored the personhood of black people, ignored therefore their inalienable rights, searched for a constitutional right to guarantee, uh, you know, liberty to black people. Of course they didn't find anything like that in the Constitution. It didn't occur to the fathers to put it that way. They interpreted the sign of the Constitution to mean that black people didn't have liberty rights and therefore denied it with mm -hmm. a remarkable phrase that blacks should be subjugated to the superior race. Mm -hmm. Nothing less has been done in, uh, by the Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. decision majority. Nothing less has been done, uh, you know, in that decision. The complete in a, ignoring of inalienable rights, the, you know, the differentiating between personhood and human being. I mean, all of this mm -hmm. sophistry that goes into it, you know, this pack of lies which is meant to deny rights to human beings who deserve rights because they're human and they deserve them by their very existence and nature. This is all the, the same thing. They go to the Constitution mm -hmm. to see whether the unborn have constitutional rights. And of course, the founding fathers had never dreamt of mm -hmm. this before. Finding that there's no mention of it in the Constitution, they interpret silence to mean that the unborn don't have rights. Right. It's the same scenario, repeated again, writ large, and as unjust and illogical the second time as it was the first, it's gonna be reversed. It just can't stand. It's an enshrined injustice. It's got to stop. Right. Sorry I got on my, my bloviating podium you you know, uh, you know, uh, here, but uh, I, I just, uh, it just, right. just remarkable. Well, we're going to have to, we're going to have to add an opening monologue for the show. That'll, that'll be the opening <laughs> monologue for the program. We'll get that as a regular se section. We're going to take a break right now. for <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back with okay. Father Spitzer in a moment. We've got to take one of our spontaneous breaks here. As we continue, we'll get on to spontaneous prayer, talking more about that, maybe a little bit about the examine prayer as well. Stay with us here on Father Spitzer's Universe. Much more ahead. And we continue here in Father Spitzer's universe, plumbing the ideas about spontaneous prayer. But first, we had talked a little pro-life, and now we've got one other question from an earlier program as well. You love the Shroud of Turin, so this must have been based on one of our conversations uh -huh. about the Shroud of Turin. Hi, Father Spitzer. We mm -hmm. visited Monopello, Italy, and saw the veil, as you mm -hmm. recently mentioned. Could you explain the difference between the veil of Monopello and the Sudarium of Oviedo? We were told that the veil of Montepello was authentic. Thank you, and uh, our prayers are for you and your successful surgery. It's uh, Dennis and Teresa, and that came to us, I guess, from Facebook. 
Oh, that's actually from email, I should say. So we hear about the shroud, then we hear about this, the monopello, mm -hmm. and then we've heard about the sidarium, uh -huh. and then sometimes you hear about mm -hmm. Veronica's veil. So how do they all fit mm -hmm. together or do they? Well, uh, let me just go to the Sudarium of Oviedo first, because that's got a very definite provenance, and that's got a very definite point of uh, evidential access, uh, which um, uh, Mount Pellier doesn't quite have. But uh, l let me just uh, back up for a second. The Sudarium of Oviedo, uh, the face cloth of Oviedo, is not the Veronica um, uh, veil. Mm -hmm. What it is, is it's a, a, a piece of cloth that uh, Jewish uh, people in the first century uh, used to wrap the face of the deceased if, if the deceased person died in a particularly macabre way. And so, for example, when they were taking Jesus down from the cross, they wouldn't have just taken his body uh, down and, and uh, carried it to the tomb. They would have definitely taken this, uh, this cloth, the sudarium, and they would have put it around his face uh, for, well, if I might just speak bluntly, so that the, the fluids that would have kind of popped up through his mouth or through his nose uh, in his deceased state, that that wouldn't be seen. If his eyes were open, that wouldn't be seen. And of course, the bruising on Jesus and the wounds on his face were so unbelievable that there's no question they would have uh, wrapped this uh, special face cloth around him to, uh, to take him down from the cross and transport him to the tomb. Now we read in John's Gospel that the face cloth, and this is the face cloth that would have, uh, the sudarium mm -hmm. that would have been used to transport him to the tomb, <clears throat> that was <clears throat> rolled up in a place by itself and placed in a corner there mm -hmm. and the shroud uh, of Turin is put in a different place. Now why does that sudarium uh, have such a good provenance and, and evidential data, uh, uh, you know, basis? Mm -hmm. the, the reason it does is because there's 124 wounds on the, that face cloth mm -hmm. that are identical to the 124 okay wounds on the Shroud of Turin. So we, I mean, the only way that that could happen, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. anything else would be astronomically beyond probability, right? Um, the, uh, the only way that could happen is if the, those two cloths touched the same bloody mm -hmm. face mm -hmm. and got the same imprint of those blood stains. Now, remember, the sudarium when Jesus got to the tomb, the sudarium would have been taken off of his face right. and put by itself. Then he would have been put in the shroud. What does that mean? There's not going to be an image right. of That's Jesus' right. face on the sudarium because the image happened when Jesus was in the shroud, when the tomb was closed. That's when the several billion watts mm -hmm. of energy emerged from every three-dimensional point in his body mm -hmm. for one forty billionth of a second and produced that image on the very surface of the fibrils on the cloth. Now, that didn't happen to the sudarium, okay. but what you do see on the sudarium are the same blood wounds. It had to have touched the same mm -hmm. face. It has to be the same cloth that uh, St. John is talking about, rolled and put uh, by itself in the tomb that the apostles Peter and Paul saw, I mean, uh, Peter and John saw when they came uh, into the tomb and looked in. Now, that's the face cloth of Oviedo. So mm -hmm. we know what that is, and that we have provenance for from about 612 AD. So mm -hmm. when it moved from Jerusalem through Edessa, it eventually came uh, to Oviedo, Italy. So they were trying to transport that cloth, get it out of the range of uh, Muslim invaders at the time. And of course, as they're kind of, uh, you know, uh, moving it mm -hmm. along, what they they uh, they get into southern Spain, it eventually goes into the hand of several bishops. Finally, of course, it goes to the Cathedral of Oviedo. Mm -hmm. It's put in the 
container there, and it's never removed. It stayed right. there all this time, and we have its provenance from one bishop to the right. next bishop to the next bishop, uh, you know, from right. about uh, the beginning of the 700s right. onward. Right. So we certainly know that the shroud has to be from that, uh, from 700 or earlier, and, and because it has to have touched the same face as the, the face cloth of Oviedo. So that's why we know, that, and that cloth is very important, one mm -hmm. of the ways of dating the shroud far beyond, you know, uh, far before the 1500, which well, that's, that's fraudulent point, right? 1988 that's true. carbon that, dating. That's true, that would, yeah. that would yeah. show that, right. Uh, yeah, yeah I no, about that. unquestionably. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Now, what so, about and, what about Mon important for that? As what well. about Montepello? Because you kind of stipulated about that. that. Is, yeah. Now that does have an image on it, and it also has um, blood stains on it. And somebody indicated to me, though I've not seen this verified in an academic paper, whereas with Oviedo, the Sudarium, I have seen the academic papers on that. Mm -hmm. I've seen the many academic papers on the Shroud of Turin. I haven't yet seen the academic papers on Mount Pellier. However, what I do suspect mm -hmm. um, is that either, if, if this is an authentic uh, and I have no reason to believe it's not authentic, but if it is authentic, it either has to be like a Veronica veil or there's some other kind of face cloth that was put on mm -hmm. uh, Jesus' face um, when um, uh, he was in the tomb. Now, of course, um, the, the, the comparison of the blood stains, as was done with the face cloth of Oviedo, that has not been done with Mount Pellier. And I don't see that the blood stains, um, you know, just from surface looking at it, are identical. So I'm believing right. myself that it had to have occurred oh, sometime before Jesus arrived at the tomb. And so maybe it is kind of a Veronica veil. How the image got on there, I'm not sure. Right. If the blood type is AB positive, that of course is is one indication. Uh, you know, of, of, it's certainly Jesus's blood type on the Sudarium of Oviedo and the Shroud of Turin. Uh, but you know, I mean, there's a lot of people with AB positive blood type. Right. So I mean, that there's all kinds of possibilities for that. But I just don't know its provenance. Right. I just haven't seen the academic papers on it. And I just, you know, I, I right. certainly value the question. I do want to make a, a bit more deep investigation right. of it. But it, right now, I would say it's either a kind of Veronica veil um, where the origin of the image is, is unknown, unknown right. uh, or uh, maybe there's right. uh, some other problem. There does uh, seem to be, yeah, like but, you indicated, there does seem to be a little more controversy uh, about it. And I know Paul Body, oh, yeah. who works for us in Rome, wrote a book about it. He's a big supporter of it. And uh, Pope Benedict yeah. had gone to see it. Uh, uh, Emeritus yeah. had gone to see it when he was Pope. And so there, there are more yeah. discussions about it because of that. But there does seem to be another mm -hmm. side where people do have some questions as you indicated. Let's get to another question here, one on our topic mm -hmm. before we go to the break here. And this one has to do mm -hmm. with spontaneous prayer. How does fasting right. relate to prayer? Is one more efficacious mm -hmm. than the other or do fasting and sacrifice turbocharge prayer? And this is blessings from <laughs> Christine from north of the border up in Canada. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, yeah uh, Christine, actually, and that's not a bad way of characterizing fasting mm -hmm. because, as you probably know, when Jesus needs, uh, is recommending to his apostles, his disciples, that they turbocharge your, their prayer, they actually, he does actually say, you know, you, you should have this one, for example, a devil that they couldn't uh, cast out. He will say something like, with this one, you need prayer and fasting so he will include uh, the fasting in there that that there has to be you know this other kind mm -hmm. of of dimension that that sort of turbocharges a prayer now you know are you saying that in order for the lord to hear our prayers or uh you know um uh, all the time that that we're going to uh, need to turbocharge him with fasting no i'm not saying that at all I'm saying that the Lord hears our prayers. He judges the prayers that we have, mm. uh, you know, according to those criterion uh, that I have given before. So if you're <coughs> asking for a healing or you're asking 
you know, that your son be kept safe or you're asking for, um, you know, a, a job or whatever it may be, remember the criteria. Number one, the Lord's not going to do anything that is going to undermine even remotely your salvation. Mm -hmm. So fasting, you know, that's not going to help. If, if there's any remote possibility that answering your prayer as you've asked it is going to undermine your salvation, mm -hmm. it's not going to be done. The Lord's going to let things take another course so that your salvation is going to be optimized. Number two, mm -hmm. Lord's not going to do anything, even remotely, that's going to undermine the possibility of the salvation of somebody else that you might touch or affect in your life. So, for all intents and purposes, the Lord's not going to do something, right? I mean, maybe you don't know that you're going to touch Joe, uh, uh, you know, Doe mm -hmm. in your life, right? You might not know that, but the Lord may know that, and the Lord may see that the suffering you're going through now is going to touch Joe and his salvation in some future mm -hmm. moment, or maybe in the next moment, or the present moment, or whatever it may be. But the case is, he's never going to allow us to sort of, uh, or allow suffering uh, that, that we're, uh, uh, you know, the alleviation of suffering to undermine our possibility for affecting the salvation of family, mm -hmm. of friends, and so forth. So again, number three, he's not going to alleviate suffering that's going to in some way undermine our freedom. We, it, it, it's absolutely essential that we remain free. This freedom <clears throat> that we have is awesome, and, and it, it's going to determine who we become. It's going to determine whether we're on the right road or the wrong road. So remember, Jesus is not going to sit there and undermine the freedom of somebody, not even a horrible tyrant like Hitler, right? He's not going to give Hitler uh, an automatic lobotomy mm -hmm. because the guy's going to cause too much trouble, right? So he's going to let Hitler be free. Now, could he cause a divine prov providential conspiracy mm -hmm. around Hitler so that ultimately through our good efforts and freedom, he will lose the war? Yes, mm -hmm. he could do that. But is he going to go and go, Hitler, you're too much trouble. Whap. Because, of course, where do you start drawing the line? Mm. Of course, there's Hitler, there's Stalin. Well, maybe there's this other guy who's going to do something somewhat cruel. Well, does he get the lobotomy too, or does he just get a super shock? And if he gets a super shock, right, I mean, then, of course, we become Pavlovian dogs. Mm. We're no longer, right, it's like, whoa, you know. You're looking over your shoulder. Right. I mean, is this going to cross the line? Am I going to get the Pavlovian conditioning? Right. right. So he can't do this. He can't, you know, lobotomize, super shock, do anything else. Third, a fourth thing, he he's not going to, uh, you know, uh, alleviate your suffering if it's going to mean undermining somebody else's freedom that you are related to. So he's not going to uh, basically give you a miracle that's going to cause somebody else mm -hmm. to be unfree. So you, you got to sort of remember, you know, that there's a limit to sort of super uh, uh, turbocharging your prayers. And, and of course, there's a five and a six. Right. He's also going to be looking not just to alleviate your suffering, but to alleviate the suffering of other people through their freedom that's not going to interfere with their salvation. He's going to be looking for those things at the same time, too. So uh, okay. uh, the Lord has a series, uh, a set of criteria, and he does implement right. them. But yes, if you're dealing with, for example, a spiritual battle, and that's a particular kind of suffering, uh, then fasting mm -hmm. is helpful. If you're trying to overcome, for example, uh, you know, um, something uh, in your life, you know, where you feel like, oh, I've, I've got, you know, kind of an addiction or, or something like that, or I'm just kind of pulled into, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, gossiping. I cho choose mm -hmm. a, a sin, any sin, uh, you know, but you're kind of pulled into it and you want a kind of a force to be present along with the prayer. The prayer is absolutely essential. Fasting can very much help in those kinds of spiritual battles. And uh, um, well, let me ask you. you know, let me ask you, you that ask question me, well, then, Father. Yeah. With with now, is what is it about fasting that helps? Is it because it's some level of self dip, discipline and denial that one is offering? Yeah. One is offering yeah. a sacrifice. Yeah. Is that what it is? 
Well, I think it's what I call prioritization. Uh, in other words, I think the minute you say, um, the Lord is more important to me uh, than, uh, you know, uh, comfort and the food that I'm going to get. Now, believe me, uh, boy, you know, I like food and I like the comfort it gives. I'm with you. You know, but at, <laughs> at some point, <laughs> right, right you're, you really want to say, no, I, I mean, uh, when push comes to shove, you know, um, I'm going to put my, uh, my faith in the Lord above, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know uh, getting this food. And so I think it, what it is, is it's an establishing of priorities in maybe an area that is manageable, mm -hmm. like, you know, food or, or meat on Fridays or, mm -hmm. or something of that nature. Now you get to something where you're really kind of hooked. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've already established that this priority to the Lord, you know, that you can kind of ignore one thing, you can kind of push it aside, it does kind of help. It builds up, as it were, almost like a, uh, an immunity, you know, uh, it, it, you know to, to the poison. You know, it, it gives us a kind of a, a discipline and a resolve to continue putting the prioritization for the Lord in first place. And, and of course, even if that, you know, we have to just resist mm -hmm. something mightily, that we just keep putting out that thing of, Lord, you're first. Lord, you're first, and if we've proven it with fasting, then, or we prove it with a Lenten sacrifice or something of that nature, there is something to it. It really does help us in spiritual battles, in dealing with kind of sins that are, you know, are becoming addictive or kind of gripping us. It helps to kind of break the spell, right. uh, and it does, in that sense, turbocharge those spiritual battle. Uh, type of, right. of prayers. Yep. Uh, other kinds of prayers, though, God generally uses uh, the previously mentioned six criteria, and He hears your prayers, okay. uh, and if they're sincere prayers, He's listening, mm -hmm. believe me, He's just not going to do anything that'll jeopardize right. your salvation, other's salvation, your freedom, other's freedom, or other's ability to alleviate their suffering. So all in all, okay. uh, you know, he's, he, that's what he's up to. Okay, very good. You know, hearing turbocharge and, uh, and, and not eating reminds me of some of those uh, health programs that are on <laughs> advertising on television on a regular basis. Oh, yeah. I guess uh, special shakes that yeah. are turbocharged for you. I don't think it's quite the same oh, yeah. thing. But we have another question for no, you about, no. sp about spontaneous <laughs> sure. prayer. Is not spontaneous yeah. prayer good prayer at all times? It seems that this would come from a desire for a relationship. Conversation with God on a constant basis seems to be the way be the way better than conversation only in various times of trouble. I guess this is blessings from Dan. So I guess if I said, he, he's kind of saying, instead of these kind of one-off things, shouldn't you be in this ongoing conversation with the Lord? Isn't that better? Yeah, well, here's, uh, um, okay, let me just put it to you uh, real quickly with two conditions. Yes, uh, spontaneous prayer is good all the time. Uh, you know that uh, you know, and it does kind of make our prayer uh, kind of uh, you know uh, constant. And, and and of course, this has been uh, you know um, encouraged in Scripture. Uh, you know to to be you know continually praying. A lot of the saints and church fathers talk about continuous prayers. Spontaneous prayer is absolutely uh, a way of doing it. Now you have to be very careful when you say continuous prayer, mm -hmm. because <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you constantly have to be interrupting your workday, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe I'm doing writing, right? I, I can't be guilt, guilting myself mm -hmm. into thinking about, um, you know, praying continuously in the middle of trying to construct a sentence or a paragraph. Because if I do this, I'm telling you, I'm not going to get any writing done for the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be kind of, you know, becoming a schizophrenic going back and forth. Now, of course, remember what G.K. Chesterton said about heresy. Mm. Every heresy is merely an exaggeration mm. of the truth. And, you know, St. Ignatius, knowing this very well, put it into the spiritual exercises. And, of course, he knows that, that what does the devil do? Uh, the devil comes appearing like an angel of light, mm. right? So he's appearing like an angel of light. He's going to give you a very pious and good suggestion. 
Second step, what does he do next? He exaggerates it to the point where it will become a matter of having you not be at peace, of having you give up in despair, or of having you interrupt everything you're doing that's work for your family, work for the kingdom, work for the good of humanity. So he's got his little agenda in mind. He comes to you with a pious suggestion. Pray continuously. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Encouraged by scripture. What could be better? Step two, exaggerate it. That means praying continuously does not mean, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, taking effective times, times when you really have a break, times when you can really make a prayer when you're not having to be mentally concentrated and so forth and so on, right? When you can actually at appropriate mm -hmm. times, you're trying to bring prayer into your life as often as you can. That's the way in which this, uh, you know, uh, scriptural is intended. But the devil comes to you and says, no, 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 no. It doesn't mean the more continuous prayer you have, the better. That's what St. Paul means. Then <clears throat> once you've gotten to that point, right, and you're, you're at the point where you've guilted yourself now into thinking, gee, I'm a pilot, but I better not concentrate on what's going on here in the plane. I, I really need to be doing more continuous prayer. And, of course, you're trying to think of more creative continuous prayers because, of course, you, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of, you know, uh, uh, wiping right. out on, on repeating all the prayers. Then, of course, you find yourself doing one of three things. Number one, you could say, Di step three, right? This is too much. I can't keep doing this, right? I, I, I mean, God is expecting too much of me. That wasn't God. Mm -hmm. That was my interpretation of a scriptural passage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that was the Holy Spirit making that exaggerated interpretation. It's the evil spirit, of course, says mm -hmm. St. Ignatius, who's doing this. For what reason? To get you to give up. Or number two, you do something where you're concentrating on prayer in the middle of something where you should be concentrating on your work. I'm not saying the plane's going to crash or the right. whatever, but you can't have your engineer sitting there praying continuously as he's trying to do the numbers to build the bridge. Mm -hmm. Could be unfortunate. God doesn't want that. Only the, the, the devil, but he a mistake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> something that you make a, a real critical error and of course, you blame God. That's, you know, I was praying continuously and look what happened. It wasn't God's advice. It's, of course, the evil spirit's advice. So essentially, what the evil spirit's going to do, come to step one with a pious suggestion. Step number two, exaggerate it. And step number three, wait until you make a mistake, mm -hmm. you get depressed, you do something completely uh, uh, crazy, or you just say, I give up, I right. can't keep doing this, you know. And, and so, and he's got you. And he guilts because, you, of course, guilts you into you do it, giving up in many it. ways, right? Right, exactly. I could see exactly. after the... And then blaming God. Right. We don't want yeah. the pilot doing spontaneous prayer like help when he finally realizes that they're having some <laughs> trouble in the cockpit because he hasn't been paying attention. But we're, we've got to pay attention to the clock and take a quick break. we got one more break in the show. Right. Authentic, spontaneous prayer and other issues uh, we're, we're talking about in Father Spitzer's universe. Much more ahead. Make sure you stay with us. And again, thank you for staying with us here. I'm Doug Keck with Father Spitzer in his universe, and we rejoin him out on our West Coast studios, Christ Cathedral campus. We're talking about spontaneous prayer, some of your questions. Here's another question as we're uh, getting down to the end of things here. We've mm -hmm. got an email that came in. This person writes, my spontaneous prayers seem to be in anger at God by my fear of not getting what I want from God. I'm angry because nothing can happen without God permitting it, like calling out, no, Lord, when, my, when hearing that my grandchild is sick. Is this type of spontaneous prayer acceptable to our Lord? So hearing something that's bad and saying, no, Lord, is that a spontaneous prayer? 
Well, um, it, it's certainly a, a, a prayer. It's, it's not a prayer that we're generating, uh, you know, to, to have the Lord reach in and help us. But it is a kind of prayer because you're, you're literally asking the Lord not to let your grandchild be sick. And, and yet, it is a very legitimate prayer. Right. I mean, you hear something, and, and of course you don't want your grandchild to be sick, and of course you want the Lord to hear your prayer, and of course you think that that, that request uh, is, is a, a reasonable request, and in all respects, it is a reasonable request, except for those six criteria I just mentioned. We don't know what the future of your uh, grandchild is. We don't know whether the sickness that your grandchild might have is going to do something for him or her that will help in their salvation. Mm -hmm. Remember, uh, you know, suffering and challenge can frequently help us toward salvation, liberate us, shock us out of superficial uh, views of the meaning of life or can actually increase our faith, increase our dependence on God, increase our, uh, you know, desire, you know, to do something for other people who are suffering in like manner, increase our compassion. So suffering is not a bad thing. Well, of course we sympathize. We don't want anyone to feel pain. We don't want anyone to undergo, you know, real difficulties in their life. Of course, we have ordinary empathy where we want, you know, people to, mm -hmm. to, to have as, well, an e as easy a life as possible. Right. I mean, it's, it's every, <clears throat> you know, person's wish. Now, on the other hand, though, uh, there is some real good that comes from suffering mm -hmm. for us, for our salvation, for our purification, so that we can offer it up to God for others' salvation, so the, the salvation of others that we might touch in mm -hmm. our lives. For, you know, all these things are really important. God's number one agenda is not to alleviate pain. God's number one agenda is to get us to heaven and every person that we touch to heaven. And if suffering is a good thing, then he's going to use it. Mm -hmm. Now, remember this. You know, suffering in and of itself is not something good. Suffering plus faith mm -hmm. is what gets to something good. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is experiencing suffering, w w our job as a grandparent or as a parent or as a Christian friend, a Catholic friend, is to you know, help them you know, I I with prayer or help them with their faith in their time of vulnerability and suffering and of course to help them as best we can to overcome the suffering mm -hmm. but we also have to be open to God's will because remember God's will is always oriented toward heaven toward eternity toward purification mm -hmm. in love toward getting us out of superficiality, toward getting us out of the darkness, to helping us contend with evil, to, you know, these are his objectives. Our objectives sometimes, and I know myself only too well, I'm like you, uh, <laughs> listener, I'm out there going, oh my gosh, no, no way, right. you know? I mean, if, you know, and when I heard about my eye disease, you know, and, and uh, you know, I was in Italy there, and, and, the, and the retinal specialist said, oh, questo non è un problema de, della bifocale, è un problema della retina, you know, and what do you mean it's not a bifocal problem? It's a, problem with my retina. I said, what do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean? He said, I put you in an Italian house. I said, no. I, don't. <laughs> I said, I go home to the United States. I said, I'm going home right now. Right. You know, and of course, it, it, he was right. He was dead on right. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, here was my prayer to God. Mm -hmm. No, I'm a scholar. I need to read. I need to be able to do these things. And of course, God had the big plan all ready mm -hmm. for me. Uh, there would be people who would, would read to me, uh, computer programs that would read to me. Mm -hmm. You know, a, he's going to lever my suffering into really good stuff for not only my salvation, but the salvation mm -hmm. of the people I was going to touch to help people who I was going to touch 
deal with their suffering and so forth. He had a big plan and he had all the counter positions worked out and of course I couldn't see a single one of them. As a matter of fact, I was so dumb at that time in my life and I admit I was 30 years old that uh, uh, when um, I was been busy finishing my prayer of no, mm -hmm. you know, you can't do this to me. What in the world could you be thinking? And of course I had no idea in the world, but he had compassion, he had my salvation, mm -hmm. the salvation of others and mine, a whole plan on how to help me. Of course I didn't know it. Right. Now the main thing of course is I go into my provincial's office, right? This is hilarious. And so he's talking to me about this and he goes, uh, he goes, uh, well now, uh, you know, uh, wh why are you here in, 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 you know, back from Rome so soon? I said, oh, well, you know, I got this eye problem. And he's going, oh, well, 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 what do you think about it? I said, well, Tom, you know, I mean, if you want me to kind of bail out of the Jesuits here, I, I mean, I know, you know, I'm, I'm basically damaged goods, you know. If, if you don't think I can, I can hack it or do the job without some special provisions and, mm -hmm. you know, you need to cut the old uh, ripcord here, you know, go ahead and do it, you know, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll do it. And this my provincial's looking at me and he's going, well, what, what spirit have you been listening to? <laughs> really? Going back to, that's the exact thing he said to me. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, that evil spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he would have me bail. Right. That's that's exactly. That's not what God's saying. Mm -hmm. That's what he, the evil spirit, wants. Right. So of course I, 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 you know, now I can see it in retrospect. But we just have to have that kind of trust that God does have stuff in mind. He already has alternative plans. He uh, he knows very well what the consequences are. He knows also that the sacrifices we will make will be good for our salvation and the salvation of others and the purification of our love and the deepening of our faith. He knows it. He knows it through and through. What we got to do is trust. But yes, mm -hmm. can you say that prayer? Oh, yes. I think that's a fine prayer. No, I've done it a million times and the Lord has heard it a million times and he loves you in the midst right. of that prayer. And believe me, even as you're saying this in abject pain and anger, right. he loves you not one scintilla less. Right. Instead, he's figuring out the plan whereby he's going to bring your loved one or you right. to some better platform for your salvation or the salvation of others, the deepening of your faith, etc. So, you know, hang in there and that's a fine prayer. But at some point, just say this other prayer right. along with it. Lord Jesus, I place my trust in you. Right. Lord Jesus, exactly. I place my trust in you. A very, very good spontaneous right. prayer to compliment the no. Right. And we think so much about the last year of mercy from last year and how popular the Divine Mercy yeah. devotion is and that whole idea. And I remember yeah. a great proponent of it used to always write in the book, trust even more. And that's really what it is about, yeah. is, is having that trust that, that God is not going to forsake us or let us down. And we're just about out of time. Why don't you mention the book, because we've been talking a little bit about suffering and dealing with prayer. You have a new book. What's the book called again? It's called The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Contending with Suffering Through Faith. The Light Shines On in the Darkness, Contending with Suffering Through Faith. Uh, you can pre-order that on uh, Ignatius Press or Amazon, and uh, it's unfortunately not going to be out until mid-March, but um, it will be out, I promise you. And uh, um, uh, at that point, uh, some of the things I've been talking about will be, I hope, manifestly okay. clear, although I, I do have a tendency to bloviate in writing as well as speech. <laughs> oh, no, it's just you have, again, it's, it's a fullness there. And, of course, we'll see about getting that through our religious catalog as well. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We'll see you next week. I guess we'll be moving on to probably the examined prayer as uh, we'll join you yeah. then. Uh, have a great week and stay well, okay? Father Spitzer, of course. Thanks, Doug. And don't forget that we've also got Mother Angelica's new book on suffering and burnout available through the EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. Mother knew a lot about suffering, and many of our audience finds what she's written on suffering and, and burnout quite consoling. And again, join us next time. We'll talk about the examined prayer. Don't forget to go to EW10.com 
and check out all the times you can see the re-airs of this program, whether they be on television or actually on radio. And this is Doug Keck once again uh, joining you from Father's Business Universe. We'll see you next week. Thanks.